And its size depends on Fourier tension. So I'm talking about Fourier in two dimensions. Everything is Fourier. So that's now, in four dimensions, you still make a two-dimensional measurement. That's the first thing to understand. So the symplectic form in four dimensions is a sum of, um, that you've got omega zero, which is the sum of dx to h dy one plus dx to h dy two, so it's a sum of area form. And what you think of is you have a little bit of surface in four dimensions, and you can project it onto the x one y one plane and get its area, and you add to it the area you get projecting on the x two y two plane. So that's the measurement you make. And um, what you get is a very, what I think of as a flabby measurement, because if you have a piece of surface, it of course has an area, which is just the integral of omega over the surface. But if you move the surface, keep, keeping the boundary fixed, then you don't change the measurement, because it's a, omega zero is a closed form, and so Stokes is zero, and then you the same. So it's very, very different from Romanian geometry, because in Romanian geometry, you have two points, you have the distance between you have the length of an arc between them. But if you start moving that arc, then you suddenly get a different length. Or well, here, you don't. You don't move. And um, so that's just saying that. So, so we get these flabby measurements in symplectic geometry. Now, the other, another real difference in Euclidean, in Euclidean geometry is that, there, is that the geometry is, is um, it's different in different directions. Because we're in four-dimensional space for this thing. And if we take, say, the x1 and x2 plane, and it projects down to a line in the x1, y1 plane, and a line in the x2, y2 plane. So its area is zero. So you have directions in which the area is zero. Those, you know, plane on which the form vanishes identically is called Lagrangian. So you have directions in which the you get zero area, but of course there are directions where you get positive area and also directions where you get negative area. So you have a very asymmetric, it's anisotropic this space, so different directions in this space. Um, and if you're looking in higher dimensions, I was talking about four dimensions, but in higher dimensions in R6, you just do the same thing. You just group the coordinates in pairs and add them up and you get a sum of area. Um, and where does this structure come from? I want to say a little bit about it. It comes from physics. And in physics, you have your coordinates in group because you have the position coordinate and the corresponding momentum coordinate. You have x, you know, p's and p's. And what you're measuring is a measure of in one direction. You have a p and a q, and you measure the sort of some measure of entanglement of those two things, how much you have in that direction. You add them up. Um, so that's where this structure comes from. And it, it gives you, I mean, it seems very strange that this, this odd measurement that you're making has any intrinsic meaning at all. But it actually does have a lot of intrinsic meaning. There's a very, you know, it looks, the, the space is very different from the, you know, an inner product of the space where all directions are the same. But there's a very interesting group of, of symplectic trans linear symplectic transformations to reserve the form. And um, you know, sort of, you have to understand the linear geometry. That's why I'm talking about the linear symplectic geometry that really underlies the smooth symplectic geometry, which, which is when you work on the manifold. Now, so if you work in a, a you know a general smooth manifold, you have an even-dimensional manifold, and the symplectic structure is simply a closed non-degenerate two. So the closeness means that d omega vanishes so that you have this flabby measurement property. So if you're measuring the area of the surface, it only depends on the boundary. So if it's a little piece of surface, of course, it depends on the quantity. Um, and it's non-degenerate, which means that if you're, there's always a, I've written it down, no, I haven't written it down here. If you're given a vector b, you can always find another vector w such that the, so that Omega doesn't vanish on that pair. So there's no completely null direction. Now, one of the things, one of the reasons this is an important structure is that there are many diffeomorphisms in space that preserve. And um, it turns out that if you have a, 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 a symplectic manifold and a function on the H, H for Hamiltonian, then it gives you a flow on that space that actually 
preserves this function. So how you get this is, um, so, so you get this flow, um, omega, preserving the symplectic orbit, and those, those are called the symplectic orbit. And um, the form is a solution of the differential equation, the Hamilton's differential equation, which is generated by a vector field. So you, you see, you have a function which gives you a one form dh. The symplectic form gives you a pairing between vectors and covectors. Like, you know, if you have a one form, so you plug in a vector there, that's a one form. Well, you, you get, you, this is also a one form, because you've got a two form, where you plug, you build in the first thing, so this has got one three variable. So this gives you, this omega gives you an isomorphism between um, one forms and vector fields. And it turns out that if you look at the lead derivative of this vector, this vector field, it preserves omega constants. So this vector, this um, vector field is called the symplectic gradient of omega. So it's a kind of gradient, but you're not using a you're not using a symmetric bilinear form to get the gradient from one form. You're using this symmetric form, and so it has very different properties from the usual symplectic gradient. Anyway, you can write down the equations, and to give you an example, if you just take the um, the sum of squares on R two. Then the, the one form is x dx plus y dy, and the vector field is y dx minus x dy. And that, of course, generates a self motion. And you get a clockwise motion which preserves the self -form. So, So it, it happens in general that this flow, xh, always preserves the numbers. So h is what's called the Hamiltonian it's an energy function. This is in classical mechanics, this would be the simple harmonic motion. And um, the energy level is conserved by this one. We're talking about conservation energy the So these are, this is a very, very simple kind of symplectomorphism. But in fact, this process here, I could have let my function h depend on a, another variable t, time. And then I would have got a time-dependent vector field for every, for every value of t. I would have got the vector field. But that still generates the flow which preserves the symplectic form. So then I get a path in the symplectic morphism. And that gives you basically all symplectic morphisms, all the ones that are isotopic to the identity, if your space is um, symplectic. So you see there are many, many, so there's an infinite dimensional proof of symplectic morphisms. So that means there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, sort of play in symplectic. You have a symplectic structure, it's not all rigid, it's very different from a Romanian structure where you expect a finite group of isometries. Here we have this infinite dimensional group of, of symplectic transformations. And that's what the symplectic embedding problem is about. It's saying, what are the properties of these symplectic organisms? What, what can they do? What can they, what can they not do? Um, OK. So you know, in the 19th century, the, the, the symplectic geometry really started in the 19th century um, where people were studying, you know, various classical systems like um, pendulum swinging of pendulums or spinning tops, things like that, where you could serve energy. And Hamilton was the one who formulated the equations of motion. You could give them either as an Lagrangian form, which means you're minimizing some Lagrangian action motion, or you could give them in terms of the Hamiltonian form. And he formulated it in terms of the Hamiltonian. And um, in so doing, then he uh, enabled himself, enabled this, you could tackle, you could solve the equation more easily if you understood this, this problem. So here's a, a postage stamp of Hamilton, who was a great Irish mathematician with the Hamiltonians. And um, this stamp, actually, when I went to Ireland, I discovered there, were, there, there was a mathematician who was actually president of, of Ireland, this is the Irish Republic in, in, the, in the Second World War. And uh, he was the one who got the stamp made. He was very proud. And then he actually managed to get the stamp made for Ireland. But anyway, they were very proud of him. And this is Sonia Kowalewska, who was also a stamp made of her. She was, of course, a great Russian mathematician. I mean, Russian, but she, but she did actually study spinning tops. And so she was using the ideas of symplectic geometry to, to 
um, sold in the process of production time. So this is what people were doing in the 19th century. And then I wanted to say something just briefly about you know, another thing um, that symplectic geometry, I started working on it in the mid 1980s, which is when Misha Gormov did, um, did a, wrote an amazing paper um, noticing connections between symplectic geometry and complex geometry. So now I'll say a little bit more about that. But you know, both of these are even dimensional series of this complex plane, of course, dimensional, any complex vector space is two-dimensional. And there's a, a lot of deep connections between symplectic and complex geometry. And they were first noticed and exploited by Misha Gromov. Um, and that really led to an explosion of work in the area. So Misha Gromov himself introduced in his paper in 1985, introduced the notion of a general curve, um, which is an essential tool. And uh, then Andreas Fleur used these ideas to develop um, Fleur theory, which is a kind of Morse theory, infinite dimensional Morse theory. So what he noticed was that if you're on, you're looking at um, loops in a symplectic manifold, for example, if you're looking at a path of loops, that's actually a two-dimensional object because you've got a, a path. Well, a loop is a, is a circle. A path of loops is a cylinder. That, if you look at the flow generated by the action function, which is a very natural function on the loop space, um, although that, you know, the loop space is an infinite dimensional manifold, if you have a vector field on an infinite dimensional manifold, it often doesn't have a nice flow, right? I mean, it's, it's a very complicated question as to what kind of flow it has. But this action function has very well understood critical points. So you can say what the critical points are. They have geometric meaning. And what Andreas Fleur realized is that if you look at the, the gradient flow, there's a sort of gradient vector field. You just can't integrate it into the dimension. But if you look at the flow, that gradient flow, and you think of it what it's doing to loops, that you get a, an equation for a two-dimensional surface. And that is a default Cauchy-Riemann equation. It's a kind of general Perturbed geomorphic curve. And using that, he built up the notion of Fleur theory. Um, he did it in both in symplectic geometry, which is the loops and the you know, paths in the loop space. He also did instant and Fleur theory, which is the paths and connections on the format. But that takes us very far. But anyway, these were the two really new discoveries that were made in the, in the 1980s which brought a lot of interest to this field, which is more of a moribund for them, because nobody could prove anything. There's lots of questions that people could answer. And then there's a whole lot of new tools, and so a lot of new insights and so on. Um, and I'm going to say very little about, nothing actually, about more than I've said about geomology. But you know, these ideas, are very related to homology as a basis of uh, the mirror symmetry, and that's the relation between string theory and, um, mirror, and symplectic geometry. Um, so you know, these are very important notions. But I'm going to—I'm more of a somebody who is actually interested in what symplectic structures look like, so what, what, are, what the local properties are, rather than things about mirror symmetry. Um, anyway, so let me say a little bit about the relation of symplectic to complex geometry. And so the related view of the complex numbers. So we think of the plane, R2, and we identify it with C. I mean, we've got, we've got coordinates x and y, so we think of C as x plus i, y, where i is the square root of minus 1. And um, then what's the relation between the symplectic form, which is a skewed form, and the dot product. Well, they're just related by, you see, the symplectic, perhaps I've got a feature here. The symplectic form is the area of this rectangle, right, which is, which is the length of v plus the length of w times the sine of the other. Well, the dot product, you take the length of v times the length of w times the cosine of the other. So what that means is, instead of looking at this angle, theta, the cosine would be a pi minus, a, a pi over 2 minus theta. So really what you're doing is taking V and rotating it by I, rotating it to 90 degrees and taking the 
the dot product as well. So you have a relation between the symplectic form, which is omega 0 of e to w, and the dot product. You just take the dot product of i times e to the w, and that, that gets you the relation. Um, and so what I have realized was, you know, in a complex plane, you have this multiplication by i. But if you're on a, an arbitrary even-dimensional manifold, or even on a, I mean, if you're on a complex manifold, of course, you have a, in the tangent directions, you can multiply by i, because the tangent vector space is a complex vector space. If you're on a complex manifold, the tangent one of the natural complex structure, and you can multiply by i. And then you get something analogous. I mean, in, in a, for a complex manifold, um, you have the dot product, which, which and if you put i in it, you sort of get a commission. If you, you get a commission metric on it, and this omega will be the Kähler form of that commission metric. So if you're on a Kähler manifold, you have a natural system. But if you're on an ordinary, you know, two n even dimensional manifold, you don't have multiplication by i. Well, Brummer said. We don't need a complex structure on the manifold simply to be able to multiply by i in the tangent model. What we're saying is the tangent model has got to have a complex structure. And we use that for the word, we use j for the operator of multiplying by i in a, in a vector system. So j is, is what's called an almost complex structure, and um, j squared is an operator on tangent vectors, but we need to j b. And j squared is minus the identity. Um, so it's like multiplication by i. It, it turns the tangent bundle into a complex vector bundle. And the whole important thing is that you're not interested just in any old j. You're interested in the ones which are what we say tamed by omega. They're positive related to omega and zero in the sense that omega zero is a pair of pj means positive. So, so that's saying that. If you have a complex line in your tangent space, that by B and J B, then the area form is, is non-trivial on that complex line. So that's what an almost complex structure is. And every symplectic manifold has a tractable family of almost which are tamed in this way. So um, that that and that just gives you it, that actually gives you associated metrics. But what it gives more importantly is it gives you this operator for J. And um, so then, what are J homomorphs occur? Well, they're the right animal of geodesics. They're, they're one complex dimension. So instead of having you know, geodesics in the shortest distance between two uh, points in a Romanian manifold or in a hyperbolic space or something, we still have geodesics. Here we're, we're talking about the two dimensional objects, which is the And um, they're, they're, so they're, so it's like we call them curves, but they're complex curves. So they're two real dimensions. So they're two real dimensions. So they're surfaces that could be spheres or tori tor or cylinders or something. And, and to say they're complex, all the general rule means that in these tangent bits, so it's changing. It means that the tangent space to this if it's a immersed surface, it's got a good tangent direction, and that's meant to be a very long chain. So that's what you mean by general surface. Um, and <coughs> and um, you know, there are lots and lots of them if you're in a complex plane, for example. Um, if you have a if you have a polynomial equation with two variables, then its solution set is uh, is homomorphic. Where it's a um, but the thing is that these are almost complex structures are very flexible. It's like the R manifolds, which are not complex, which have some structure. And also, if you're on a complex manifold, you can still have J. To have the conditions on J are that J squared is minus one, which is just a sort of algebraic condition of infinitely many. Um, many solutions for that, exception to the problem itself, like that. The other condition that omega is positive on the, on, the, on, the, on the complex direction, that's an open condition, right? So if you take J and you perturb it a little bit, that will still remain true. So you have this open infinite dimensional family of J, a very flexible. 
And you know, what's a general curve? Well, you're interested in either closed curves, like spheres or something, or higher genus curves, or you're interested in curves which have some, have some boundary conditions. So that they're, you know, they might have boundary on the Lagrangian, on the Lagrangian somehow, that would be a good boundary And then, you know, the idea is you're interested, since J is so flexible, you don't want it to have a curve which when you curtail J, it just disappears. That's not really helpful. You want to have curves which persist when you vary J. Now, you can, you know, each of these curves we're talking about can be parameterized. So you've got the Vegas agreement surface, you've got the map of the agreement surface into the manifold, which satisfies the fact that the tangent direction, the, the tangent, it basically satisfies the version of the Cauchy Riemann equation. And the fact that it's the Cauchy Riemann equation, those of you who know a bit of analysis, that's a Fredholm operator, that's a, that's a um, elliptic operator. It means that it typically has a finite solution space. Or if it's a Fredholm operator, it means that the balance space, it means that it's kernel, it's finite dimensional, it's, it's range is closed and the co kernel is final. So it has an index. And then, you know, you can find regular values, and a regular value would be the derivative onto everywhere. And if you have a regular value in a value space, then it persists. If you make the equation, you still have that space. And that's what's useful about general key curves, that there, there are lots of them, typically. They solve the solutions to some elliptic equation they come in finite dimensional families. And then there's a whole theory of these curves. We could be developing a theory of these curves and using them to probe the structure of symplectic um, Okay. So I would say that these are the basic tools of the modern theory. That either you either look at general or curves per se, or you look at some variation of the equation, like those equations. Um, but you know, all all of um, the chemistry of the theory, all of their symmetry is based on studying types of Um Okay, so let's just summarize about the special features of symplectic geometry. Well, so one thing I like to say is that the theory has you sort of two there's two faces of the theory. You can there are two different kinds of submanifolds. You can look at symplectic object. So that's like they be so you have a symplectic submanifold, the symplectic form is restricted to it is non non-degenerate. So that's like taking a complex submanifold in a complex um, in a complex um, manifold, you know, like some curve in CPM. And then you have the Lagrangian submanifolds, which are where they're half dimensional. So there's two ends of the dimensional space, the Lagrangian manifold is n-dimensional, and the restriction of the symplectic form vanishes. And they're very interesting. They're, they're more related to dynamics. You can think of them as like being something that's totally real, but it's more rigid than being totally real. Because totally real objects, you can you know, so that means that totally real, in, in a complex manifold, you say, uh, an n-dimensional sub-manifold sub or an n-dimensional <coughs> complex manifold is totally real. <coughs> the tangent space, um, it's, it's orthogonal to a j to i times the tangent space. So that there's no intersection between the tangent space and its multiplication by r. That's what we mean by um, They're actually sort of flexible objects. You can take them and move them around. But the Lagrangian object, when the symplectical vanishes, they're, they're actually Hard to come by. They don't always exist when you like them. No, they're, they're not flexible. And that, so there's a lot of interesting things about Lagrangian sub manifolds. Do they have to intersect each other? How many different kinds do you have? And so on. So that's one thing about symplectic geometry. There are two, two ways of looking at it somehow from the symplectic point of view and the Lagrangian point of view. Then there's always a very close connection to physics. I, you know, kept starting with Hamiltonian dynamics uh, in the 19th century. So, you know, people like Helmut Kofler and various students are trying to use a lot of 
know what you can tell us more about the three body problem, the absolutely classical, impossible problem in Hamiltonian dynamics. Um, so, so there's connections and things to that, and then of course there's all the dual these mirror symmetry dualities and things that's all related to um, all related to the kind of general. Then I should have mentioned Darby's theorem before, but this is an absolute, essentially basic theorem. Telling you that any two symplectic forms on the same manifold are locally different. So if you have on any manifold, always the neural point is always like coordinates. So they did look as isomorphic sort of the standard linear form of non -equilibrium. So you know I was telling you about that standard linear form, that is the local structure, because it's very different from the manifold. No curvature. Which of course means that all the invariants you might find in this type of animal is global connection. And then another very important thing is that the, the group of symplectomorphisms and the diffeomorphisms of preserved structures, infinite dimension, that preserve, you know, that you can have any function of the neural flow. Um, and rather surprisingly, it's C0 close to my old so what that means is, so C0 means that's a uniform topology. So that's just, you know, you measure the distance between, you just measure distances. You don't have nothing to do with derivatives. And so what was discovered was that, um, I think I wrote this down, um, and no, I didn't write this down, but what was discovered was that if you have a sequence of diffeomorphisms, which preserve a symplectic form, so a sequence of symplectic and they converge in the uniform topology to a diffeomorphism. So that means that you know that there's a diffeomorphism. You've got phi n. There's a phi infinity, which is the limit, and phi n is c zero close to c infinity. So that you know the image is a point to get closer and closer. Then the claim is that the limit also preserves. So it means that there's a there's a notion of um, so what what people did was find a notion of a symplectic capacity so that um, a, a diffeomorphism preserves a symplectic form if and only if it preserves its capacity. And I'll give you some examples of capacities later on, but capacities are just measures of the size of the set. So you have a subset of Euclidean space and you give a number saying how much its diameter or something. It's kind of, sort of a symplectic diameter. And so it's a C0 measure because if you take the, a set and you move it to the um, and so you, it, it, so you can say something is symplectic if and only if it preserves its capacity. And um, yeah, the condition that it preserves its capacity doesn't involve any derivatives. That's a, a C0 condition. And of course, this was discovered in the late 80s, I think, by, um, well, Eddie Ashler had a, had a proof, but he was on the in Russia and nobody quite, it was never published. Nobody quite. Anyway, um, it, it's credited to Elias Berg and then Hofer and various other people. Um, and really, it comes down from, to Florence on the But um, what this means is that because you have this way of deciding whether something is symplectic, which doesn't involve derivatives, it means you have the symplectic geometry, for one thing, is a sort of topological series. It's not sometimes does not involve the smooth structure. And it means there's a very interesting interplay between flexibility and rigidity, because there are some things you can move around and everything is fine, and other things where you can't move very rigid. And that there's, a, there's some fine line between those, those two things that is not, still not completely understood. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to say, yeah, OK, so I was going to, that's the end of my that's the end of my sort of introduction to what symplectic geometry is. Um, so then I wanted to say something about some fundamental results and ask about some two dimensions because that's you know the easiest kind of symplectic space is an orientable surface with an area form. And so all we're doing in two dimensions is doing sort of area conserving geometry. And there's a lot of interesting dynamics, but I'm not in for talking about dynamics. So if you just talk about the existence of symplectic structures, well, there's nothing interesting to say. 
you know, every closed oriented surface has a unique structure up to up to the scaling factor. And it's a unique structure because um, there are many area preserving nucleomorphisms. And here's a typical result of motor. If you have um, uh, a closed disk and you have another region which is diffeomorphic to it and has the same total area, then you can find a diffeomorphism which takes the disk to this region. So here's, for example, a disk in the plane. Here's a slit disk where I've taken the disk and I've removed a little wedge from it. And if you look, well, if you, if you either think of it as smooth or you, you take the open region, there's, a diff there's an area that's only diffeomorphism to the disk onto the slit. No, you, know, you can take any shape um, as long as it's as long as the target is diffeomorphic to your original thing, it's got the same total area, then there's nothing interesting to say about it. No, no interesting in value. But the whole symplectic embedding problem is telling you that in higher dimensions the situation is very different. So the absolutely basic theorem in this direction is Grobot's not squeezing theorem which says, let's look at the problem of embedding a ball, which is a round ball in Euclidean space of, um, I'm taking area A. So A is, the ball is, if the radius is R, then A is pi R squared. So, because that's a natural thing, since you're, since you're taking areas at your basic measurement, A is a natural size of taking the ball. So you take a ball in Euclidean space. So you take a cylinder, which is a, two-dimensional bit, um, then I write it down. It, it, so you've just put a restriction on the first, the first pair of coordinates. So it's a two-dimensional disk tied to And then you ask, when can you embed the ball into the cylinder, preserving the symmetry? That's what you're interested in. And um, Grubbuck was interested in understanding the difference between symplectic organisms, things that preserve the symplectic structure, and volume preserving, so you can preserve volume. And obviously, if you're trying to preserve volume, you can take the ball and you can embed it in the cylinder because you can just squeeze in two directions, the structure in another two directions to preserve the um, volume. But of course, squeezing in two directions, you're going to have to squeeze in two symplectic directions, and that does not allow you, that does not preserve the form. And his theorem is that there is a symplectic embedding of this ball in cylinder only if the area, the measurement of the ball is less than or equal to the area of the cylinder. So, so it's a non squeeze you can't squeeze the Well, you can do it um, in a volume of the value of the cylinder. You can expand in, say, this direction, and, um, sorry, squeeze in this direction, to down to less than one, and expand in this direction. So that was in a way, I mean, that was, I think it's a very beautiful theorem, and there's a lot of work come out of that, and that's where the symplectic embedding problem comes from. You say, okay, you cannot embed a ball symplectic cylinder. What else can you say about symplectic embedding? Um, now, just to formalize this a little bit, we can talk about, I was talking about these measurements, symplectic measurements, capacity function. And I want to point out that this non squeezing theorem is an absolutely basic theorem of symplectic geometry. It's not just a curiosity. Um, so what they, um, you, given, given a ball, you could define its symplectic, you could just take an open subset of Euclidean space, define its capacity to be the supremum of the size of the ball that it led to. So that's a perfectly good method. And then that, the claim is, so that's a symplectic invariant. Um, it would be an invariant. It's an essentially two-dimensional measurement because the cylinder, this cylinder, is it has infinite volume, but it has finite capacity. That's what the drop is. Not squeezing the so its capacity is bigger. And um, you can show that any orientation preserving diffeomorphism that preserves its capacity actually is a, preserves its symplectic form up to size. All that basically any diffeomorphism that preserves this measurement, which is, is a C0 measurement, you take your region, you move it a little bit, um, you're only going to move it a little bit. It's a C0 measurement, C0 
size of the thing. And that will tell you whether the data is So these are the, this is the kind of measurement you can make that describes the type of jump. And um, so then there are the, the whole lot of interesting problems that took take a homeomorphism which is a differential at all. Ask that it preserve the capacity question. What can you say about this? I mean, one of the questions is, Paul Robert has this very nice question. You have a notion, so you've got S4. S4, force field, cannot have a symplectic structure on it because if it had a symplectic structure in a closed two form, it's got to have a, on a closed manifold, it's got to have a cohomology class. And the square of that class has got to represent the volume, so the square is not zero. So it means that S4 cannot possibly be symplectic because there's no cohomology class. <coughs> but does it have, can it be given an atlas where the uh, transition, um, the transition homeomorphism turns out capacity? Could it be given a C0 Now that seems incredibly unlikely, but nobody has a clue. To I mean, there's no, you know, there's no cohomology class you can talk about. You just have this measurement. So anyway, that's it. You know, there are a lot of a whole host of interesting questions that people have no clue about. Um, okay. So now. Okay. So yeah. So let's go on to some other basic results. So this is saying there are no intermediate capacities. This was a question of Gromov. Well, actually, it was a question of Hofer. So, as I pointed out, Gromov's width is an essentially two-dimensional measure. Uh, because you take this uh, an object which is infinite, it's finite in two directions, and infinite in all the other directions, and it's got a finite capacity. So it's sort of like a two-dimensional measure. Um, now, what would an intermediate capacity be? This is the notion of how Hofer is designed. It would be some measurement of the size of a subset in n dimension which is monotone, so if one um, symplectically monotone, if you like, so if you open the region in bed symplectically in another, so that's a symplectically embedding, then the size of one of them is meant to be less than the size of the other. Um, and it's meant to be sort of intermediate, um, in, so it, it's meant to be some m, such that for i less than m, anything of this shape, it would be infinite. So if, if you've got, if it's, this is, this is sort of finite in two i directions, and i is less than that. So it would be infinite in, on such a region. But on this kind of region where it's finite in two m directions, it would be, sorry, in this region it's finite in two m directions, and then that's meant to have a finite capacity. That would be mean by an intermediate capacity. Of course, you've got the volume, which is when m is, um, m, is m, but we're interested in the intermediate one, which is not the capacity I've described, which is when m is 1. It's not volume, it's something intermediate. So for example, in um, dimension six, it would be a measurement that would be infinite on the cylinder, which is just finite in these two directions, but it would be finite on a four times So that's the question. This is some subjective measurement of that kind. And um, the answer is, so this was another surprising paper by Bruce, which um, led to much other work. He says that such capacity does not exist because you can embed this, this is a, a this is a cylinder, right? It's a two-dimensional cylinder times, say, four-dimensional Euclidean space into, say, a four-dimensional ball, a finite four-dimensional ball times an, a, an appropriate Euclidean space. So this tells you there's no capacity there's no intermediate capacity for M to be a um, 2. Because, I mean, it's meant to be monotone. So and it's meant to be finite on this, and then it would have to be finite on that. But that's not the intermediate capacity. And, um, I mean, I've given you this example of 2 and 4, if you were any, on the, any other example. If you had, so what he did was construct a symplectic event to show how to take the cylinder and put it in a region of the ship, symplectic. So that's what symplectic embedding is, and then you know, if you construct such a thing, then you can put the rest of the thing into your capacity. Now he didn't actually, he actually, Bruce didn't work with it. This was an improvement by Lyo and 
love to actually be able to compete to occur in a compact version of the series of this. Yeah, it's central idea of So I, I just want to say here that there are many other very interesting ways you can measure the size of the subtractive set, not just the embedding capacity. And there are, of course, lots of questions about what's the relation of one measure to the other. The Gromov widths, in a sense, is the smallest, um, but there's a whole lot of interesting questions. For example, do they all agree on complex subsets in the Euclidean space? Just many questions. So now I want to talk about <coughs> embedding ellipsoids, which is um, what I've been working on a lot, and um, starting off with a four-dimensional ellipsoid. So it's how much um, who sort of was interested in this question. Um, so we have an ellipsoid, it's now got two measurements, A and B, because any ellipsoid in four dimensions, you can always sort of normalize it. So x1, x2 are its first axis, and x3, x4 are its, are its second axis, so it's got two numbers associated with it, which are the areas, so you can diagonalize So we have this nice ellipsoid, and Hamlet was interested in when does one ellipsoid embed into another. And he eventually made this conjecture after various other versions of the conjecture he proved. He said, well, this has to be the only So out of these A and B, gets a sequence of numbers N A B, and then you say that this interior the interior of one ellipsoid embeds in the interior of another, if and only if this sequence of numbers is pipewise less than that sequence of numbers. So let me tell you what that sequence of numbers is. So we've got these A and B, and, I, and so you take all integer combinations of A, positive integer combinations, non-negative integer combinations, okay, times A plus B. And you arrange these numbers with multiplicities in increasing order. So if you take 2 and 2, then you're allowing 0, so you have 0. And then you have two copies of 2, because you can have 1 times this 2, and 0 times the other one, or you can have 0 times the first 2, and 1 times the second. Then you have three ways of getting 4, because you can have 2 of the first one, you can have 1 of each, and you can have 2 of the second. And then there are four ways of getting 6, and five ways of getting a and so on. So you get a sequence of numbers. That's, that's the set of numbers for n one two. And for n one four, well, you um, you have zero and one two and three, and then there are two ways of getting four, because you can have four times one or, or just four. And then there are two ways of getting five, and two ways of getting six, and two ways of getting seven, and three ways of getting eight. Because you can have, you can have um, eight times one, or you can have four ones and one two. No one. Two. So you get this other sequence. And you can look at them and decide that um, this sequence of numbers is pointwise less than that sequence. So each number that each you know, corresponding like this four is less than that four. Five is less than that six. So that tells you um, that this sequence of numbers is less than that sequence of numbers. So then Helmut's conjecture would tell you that there is an embedding of this ellipsoid into the form. And so I proved this um, with using work of um, myself and also work of Hutchins, um, <coughs> giving this characterization. So it's a purely numerical characterization of when one ellipsoid embeds into another And um, so just to give you an idea of what, so you know, I proved this theorem. Actually, I, I proved this first in a slightly different form. I didn't give the invariant to the form. I had a, had a criteria for one, when one of them started embeds into another. And um, Felix Schlank thought a lot about these problems. said, well, let's work out what the capacity function is. Let's work out what this means. So there's an embedding capacity function. So you can, you can normalize, you can normalize the first one to be one, and then, the, and then you've got A, which is like the eccentricity. And you can define this function, C of A, C of B, one of you, such that this ellipsoid embeds into the form. Right? So that's a perfectly long function. It's obviously an increasing function. It's also bounded below by the volume. Because obviously, if you can make this embedding, the volume of the ellipsoid has to be less than the volume of the ball. And the volumes are, um, well, they're 
the volume would be ellipsoid, maybe I should have done that. The volume would be ellipsoid is a constant times A, and the volume of the ball is a constant times U squared. So, so you know that A has to be bigger than U squared. Or rather, U squared has to be bigger than A. So um, here is the function. It's a very surprising function. We'd expect it just to be a sort of increasing function of some kind. But in fact, it starts off, it's the year one. So you, you know, and so to begin with, it just is it just coincides with the line y equals x, and so that's telling you that if you're trying to embed uh, this ellipsoid which where a is rather small, it's less than two, the best you can do is just include it in a ball of size x. There's nothing, nothing fancy you can't bend it, you can't do anything. But once you get there, it was known actually that you could, you didn't have to, it didn't continue on at the straight line, that you could modify the embedding and sort of fold it in some way. But the surprising thing is that the graph is straight. So that in fact, you can, for e, if A is in between 2 and 4, you can embed it in a ball of size two. Four, uh, size two, rather. And at this point, you're actually on the volume line. You've basically filled up the whole volume of the ball. So E14 embeds it in the ball, filling up the whole volume. And then once you get there, you get another line which goes through the origin. Um, and then you get to this five, which is a five, five and a half, and you get a line there, which is again straight. So it goes up in these sort of steps. And there are infinitely many of these steps until you get to tour to the fourth, where tour is the golden ratio. So, you know, there's a lot of number theory here that you couldn't expect. And so we have this infinite series of steps, and then we have a region here which I just put in, I have a very bad graphics program. So this is a dot. So there are some places where there are obstructions, you're above the volume of the limit, and other places where you're on the volume limit. And then after this number, which is, um, 17 over 6 squared, at that number, there are no obstructions. All the obstructions vanish. The whole thing is just, you can do this. If A is sufficiently large, then you can embed E1A into a ball provided the ball has got volume, the right volume. So that's an absolutely typical thing for flexibility geometry. I said there's a mixture between flexibility and rigidity. So to begin with, you can see this is very rigid. So this rigid staircase. There's a sort of intermediate region here where it's partly got obstructions and partly not, and then it's totally flexible. There's, there's only the volume of structure. And that, that, as I say, that's a typical behavior. And um, so this, and then the other interesting thing is that the staircase is governed by the Fibonacci numbers. I mean, there's a lot of geometry behind that that tell you why you get these invariants. <coughs> And then, then there are no obstructions, and then we have this transitional region. But then the other thing about this is that um, there's very little known in higher dimensions. Um, so Gurth's embedding, Gurth's embedding, I told you he, he made this contradiction to the, the thing about the intermediate capacity. And um, his, um, he, what, what he actually did was embed something like the ellipsoid, which is short. It, one, the small of the structure, the S is large, so it was a, it's like a big four-dimensional ball, just thick and dark side. And um, he embedded that into a, a something, a, a four ball, which is size just a bit bigger than three um, times, um, oh, this, is, this is some large number here, which I said has to be bigger than so. So he embedded this, and this kind of embedding, this is this kind of embedding means that people have no guesses, but what you know, you can make an analog of Hogwarts conjecture, but it's definitely wrong. I mean, in other words, you can take the, the set of the analogous set of numbers and say this is embedding if and only if one set of numbers is less than the other, and this is embedding. And nobody has a guess as to what the other is. Um, now, I notice I should stop very soon. So, the other question, you know, other question I've been looking at now is the stabilized embedding problem. Which is when you, you see, it's impossible to do everything in high dimensions. We don't really know any techniques. But this is a sort of version of the four dimensional problem where you, you, you allow the other directions to be very big. So you can 
T1A and acids very big, you're embedding it in a formal time Euclidean space. And so you're basically taking the four dimensional problem and then multiplying it by something that's taking the other direction. And then the question is, you can look at the embedding capacity here, and here we do have a chance of saying something about it. In fact, we do know, we know that the, the stabilized problem, you take the four dimensional problem and multiply by R2 or R4 or something, the Fibonacci set is stabilized, so that, so that the, the very rich and familiar instructions are. Um, we have a, a method now of doing, a nice method of doing embedding. So that we actually have the, uh, some finite value. You get if you're a volume value, you're so you've got a, another value, which in this case is 3a over 1 plus a. And then we have, so we have a conjecture which says that this 3a over 1 plus a should be the answer for a being equal to 4. And we, we've ch checked that for some numbers. But it gets, it's a very complicated geometric problem. You need to find instructions to say that you need to have 4 that side, and that means constructing curves in four dimensions that would give you an obstruction, and that constructing curves in three um, But just to explain, this is a, just to give you a picture, so I've got to stop. Here is the volume obstruction, this dotted line. Here, this F curve is the curve 3A over 1 plus A. And the Fibonacci stair is actually sort of ping pong between this line and the, and the other curve. So all the peaks of the Fibonacci stair actually lie on that line. So it goes up there, along, up, along, up, along, and they cross precisely at the And so, you know, and then the volume of structure gets too big, so it's irrelevant, because we can stabilize the volume, it's irrelevant. 